This is TDT Live. I'm Vidya Ramphal. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TDT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Sweet 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, Al Alexander. It is a pleasure to be here with you once again at the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference. Today on our panel, we have the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, and Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will be the moder moderator for today. The Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, will open the proceedings this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to you. Good morning to the Chief Medical Officer. Good morning to all ladies and gentlemen of the media and to all persons listening or viewing on the various platforms this morning. Normally, I, I start off with the global perspective and sometimes the regional perspective. Permit me to deviate from that this morning because I want to spend all my time, my limited time this morning, speaking solely and only about COVID and the month of December and Christmas. Christmas time is a time for family. It's a time for rejoicing the birth of Christ. It's a time to go to church in numbers. And all religions, because we are that type of people, celebrate Christmas. We gather at homes. Uh, we have little parties at home, little parang limes, whatever. And I know the past nine months have been difficult for each and every one of you. We empathize. We know the mental stress that each and every one are going through. I, I think CMO and I could agree that we are also going through that mental stress. We, you are not alone as an individual. We want to have December. We want you to have a holy, meaningful, but safe Christmas. And why? So that we could have a better New Year. Consider this an investment because we are going to ask people to make some sacrifices this December. Consider these little sacrifices, and they are little, an investment in your future for 2021. We always tell people have a bright and prosperous New Year. Now we have to tell people have a safe and healthy New Year and to try to be alive for 2021. What we would like to see for the middle and late December into January 2021 is a decrease in deaths, a decrease in hospitalizations, and we want to protect and cherish our elderly this Christmas season because it's the elderly that is going to bear the brunt of our celebration this Christmas because healthy people um, who will get COVID are going to shrug it off 80% of people who get COVID shrug it off. But it's the elderly with whom we line with, party with, and then we get COVID and we take it home. And our elderly are the ones that are going to pay the price and are going to be hospitalized. I had asked Dr. Hines to uh, bring some slides to the press conference on Wednesday, which he did. But we are going to expand on that this morning because, you know, as the old saying goes, a picture paints a thousand words. And I think the graphical information is going to be better suited than simply talking through it. So now, if we can have the slides, please, slide one. I am hope it's queued up. Yeah. So we are going to be describing what we have in circles. The circles that you think you have, and this is it. Most of us labor under the impression that I am in my home, I have a child, I have a partner, a wife, or whatever, and I go to work, and I work with my colleagues, and we think we are safe. We think we are insulated. We trust our, we trust our work colleagues. You know, we trust them, and we think they don't have COVID. But slide two is really the circle you have. Why? Because your co-workers don't exist in isolation. 
your co-workers will go to the gym. Your co-workers also have their families. Um, you might go to a small line. Your, your co-workers might go to a small line. And if you remember, the bubble at the top middle, your workplace, Dr. Alana Best was here a couple of months ago speaking about the fact that there was a cluster of 42 cases of COVID because somebody went to work knowing that they were ill. You would have heard us say that there was somebody in Point Fortin who went to a gym while she was under quarantine. So you may think that you exist in your own little bubble, but once you interact with people, you are interacting with persons of different bubbles. These are nine bubbles there. So we move from a bubble of two bubbles to a bubble now of ten. Nine plus you. Let's go back, please. Okay. Yes. So that is it. No, go back, please. Go back. Right. So that is where you are now. Not two bubbles, but this is the actual bubbles that you are interacting with at any one and time. Note the interrelationships. And this is how the virus jumps and spreads, which the next slide will start to show. It just takes one person in that small line, that spark, that little spark, right? And that is what we are scared about this December. It just takes one spark to infect one of those bubbles. It could be the small line, it could be the gym, it could be your workplace, it could be your kids' classes, it could be your partner's job, it could be your in-laws. And that is what we are trying to avoid this December. Because if we start to get those sparks, then the next slide shows the sparks grow into a wildfire where each bubble now becomes infected. So we move from a spark to an absolute wildfire which spreads. And when this spreads, our hospitals become more occupied. Our healthcare workers don't get the rest that they deserve, just like you. It means more healthcare workers have to spend Christmas taking care of you in your hospitals, in your ICUs. Our deaths will go up, and many people will spend Christmas in hospital. This is what we are trying to avoid. Anyone can catch COVID this December in your home gatherings. And that is why we are advising people not to gather this Christmas. Have a holy Christmas, have a meaningful Christmas, but have a safe Christmas. Don't let COVID parang your house this Christmas. You know the old, the, the soca parang, we parang the wrong house? Don't let COVID parang your house. So I'm hoping that these slides are helpful this morning. You can probably take them off now. I just wanted to share these slides with you in a graphical format to show that this Christmas, resist the temptation to invite people into your home from other circles because you don't know where they have been. You don't know with whom they have been in contact with. And COVID is no respecter of socioeconomic class, ethnic differences, East Indians, Africans, Chinese, Portuguese, whatever. It is no respect of geography. It is no respecter of whether you have a PhD, uh, a first degree, never went to school. It does not respect those boundaries. And no one is immune from catching COVID this Christmas if we gather in our homes in our workplaces, for parties and lunches and so on. So as I close, I just want to close by saying, don't let COVID parang your house this Christmas. We empathize, but we have one more month to go. And I guarantee you, 2021 will be a better year. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you, Minister.
We will move straight into the clinical update with Dr. Parasram, followed by a presentation on the benefits of vaccines. Hi, thanks. Um, good morning, Minister, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So I'll, I'll touch briefly on the clinical update, which is as of 4 p.m. Friday, November 27th, first. Won't go into too much detail with it. We are just over 60,000 tests completed and submitted thus far, if you look at the public sector plus the private sector. In total, 6,586 positive cases out of that lot, with a total recovered patients thus far 5,710. Within the last 24 hours, new positive cases 16. Total active cases now stand at 758, with 118 deaths. In terms of homes and isolation, we have 677 of those. By way of hospitals, 36. Step-down facilities, 29. And at the state quarantine facilities, 205. In terms of our hospital, we are happy to see in Kuva Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, there are only 23 persons at this time. One person in ICU and one person in the high dependency unit. At the Cora facility, again, a decrease in numbers. We're seeing only nine persons there. St. Anne's Hospital, one person, and Scarborough Regional Hospital at the fourth, there are three persons there and one person en route. In terms of our Claxton Bay step-down facilities, we have 16 persons, and UV Day Bay, we have 13 persons. By way of quarantine facilities, we had one additional flight last night that came in, taking our quarantine numbers up to 317, and they are spread across a number of facilities. Beginning with the home of football, we have 50 persons, DB Halls 34, UE Campuses, um, Canada Hall 32, and UE Freedom Hall 28. At the Cape Hawk Hotel 96 persons, Cascadia Hotel 29, Region Star 33, and at the Chancellor Hotel 15 persons. So I just wanted to go briefly into a small presentation, which we assume sometimes that everyone has the basic knowledge of vaccines. I want to go a little bit into detail as to what vaccines are, a little history on vaccines, and where we are in terms of vaccines as it relates to COVID-19. So if I could have the first slide. So by way of definition, a vaccine is a product that stimulates a person's immune system to produce immunity to a specific disease, thereby protecting the person from that disease. So I would go a little later on into the different types of vaccines that we have, but more or less you take a microorganism you take the whole of that organism or a part thereof, you introduce it into someone's system by a different mechanism. You can use which is most commonly known um, by injection through a intramuscular injection or subcutaneous injection. That's the most common route of administration, but we can administer by other means. There have been vaccines that have utilized, for example, inhalation and those kinds of things which have been used in the past. If we go, go to the second slide, please. So this slide just gives you an idea of the difference between vaccination and immunization. Sometimes we people tend to use it interchangeably. They are not the same thing. So vaccination is the act of introducing a vaccine into the body to produce immunity to a specific disease. So the objective of vaccination programs across the world are really to build individual level immunity to a particular disease and basically go from individual levels to population levels. So immunization, on the other hand, is a process which a person becomes protected against a disease through vaccination. So it means that you have inoculation of the pathogen through vaccination, and then by a process, you, know, you build immunity to it by a process within your body where you develop antibodies and helper cells to generate an immune response. When that immune response rece receives a certain threshold, the person is said to be immunized or, or achieves immunization so vaccination and immunization are two separate things. But immunization can only come about usually through vaccination or through active disease prior. Next slide. So the, a little touch on the history of the vaccination. The first vaccine was developed for smallpox introduced by Edward Jenner in 1796. Basically, he took samples of what was then cowpox, some samples from the actual blebs that were creating on the animals, inoculated his own family by putting it into their skin and found out there was some buildup of immunity in those individuals protecting them from smallpox. In 1914, we saw the pertussis vaccine coming on stream. 
diphtheria quickly after 1926, and then tetanus, all three being combined in 1948 to create a trivalent vaccine, DTP. In Trinidad nowadays, we use um, DTP plus polio as well, which was initially given in the oral form and now is in the intra in intramuscular form as well. Next slide. So again, you see the smallpox. This is something that most clinicians, because of vaccination, have never seen in their life. I, I have never seen a case of smallpox myself as well because it has been eradicated because of vaccinations and the success of vaccination programs worldwide. It just gives an idea of the, the skin manifestations of this disease on the left-hand side of the picture. Next slide. So we look at the role of vaccines. And vaccines are the most important public health interventions in history and has been shown to do so for many, many diseases, including measles, including influenza, including what we just showed about smallpox, polio, and many other diseases. They have led to the eradication of certain diseases, smallpox, um, certain other diseases from the region, different parts of the world, the region of the Americas, and can lead to significant reduction in the incidence of many other viral and bacterial diseases. If the uptake is great in a population, we develop something called as a population herd immunity, which is also known as community immunity, and I'll go a little bit into detail in the other com upcoming slides. Next slide. Good. Right. So this is based on a CDC document that gives you 10 reasons why we should vaccinate. Um, so just to run through the list, vaccine preventable disease have not disappeared, meaning that for, for most diseases, aside from smallpox and other things, we, we still have those diseases prevalent in different parts of the world, different WHO regions. Vaccines generally can keep you healthy. Vaccines are important to your overall health as diet and exercise. Vaccines can, can mean the difference between life and death. And vaccines are safe. We have five other on the other slide. Go to the next slide. Right. Vaccines won't give you the diseases. They are des designed to prevent them. For example, if we, de if we give you a vaccine for COVID-19, we expect that that va vaccine won't give you COVID-19. Young and healthy people can get very ill as well from communicable diseases and therefore need to be vaccinated. Vaccine preventable diseases are expensive. And when you get ill, your children, your parents and grandparents can get ill as well. Your family and co-workers need you and need your support going forward. Next slide. So just in terms of the types of vaccines, quickly before we come to the end of it, we have four different types of vaccines in terms of the technologies currently used and in development. If we look at the first vaccine, that is the viral vector type, basically what happens is that you take another virus, for example, for COVID-19, we use an adenovirus, which is another type of virus. We take out a portion of it through gene manipulation that inactivates that particular virus, and we use that virus basically to carry the DNA of, of the inoculating strain into the human's body, and thereby we get, uh, we hope to get an antibody response. So we see AstraZeneca being one of the vaccine types that have used this technology to create a vaccine um, that is based on the viral vector technology. The other main type, nucleic acid, DNA, and mRNA, that is in the news a lot. We see messenger RNA being used in two of the frontline vaccines, Moderna, as well as Pfizer. Um, the benefit of it is that the particles themselves are non-infectious completely. They don't rely on another vector or another pathogen to bring it into the body. So it's, it's a portion of the RNA that comes in, and you develop immunity based on that response. Two other types that we have used in the past, protein-based and inactivated viruses, uh, viruses or bacteria. Next slide. So just a little bit quickly on herd immunity. The persons in blue have gotten immunity from some form. So they would have gotten immunity either by having disease previously or by being vaccinated. The person in orange would not have. And therefore, what we form is we form a protective herd around that individual, whether they, for instance, with regards to flu, we can't vaccinate children less than six months. So that will be a person that can't be vaccinated. Certain other individuals can't get vaccines for certain reasons. So if we create a herd of vaccinated individuals around an individual who is susceptible. It actually creates a bubble for that individual so that they can't possibly get infected. What we have seen for COVID-19 in the literature is that we are expecting anywhere between 50 and 88% 80, 
of the population that requires vaccination to create a herd so that there's no transmission in that particular population. Next slide. So just the impact of vaccines, and we have seen this sort of graph for many, many diseases in the past. We're looking at measles over a period of many years, from 1950, 1960, 1970. We see a precipitous drop when we introduce and license the vaccine in about 1968, thereabouts, and thereafter a very, very low level of that particular disease in the United States going through that time. We have maintained the measles, mumps, and rubella in the region of Amer Americas for many years, consistently trying to get that threshold of herd immunity upwards of 95% of our population, thereby keeping that line at the bottom very low and the susceptible individuals very low as well. Next slide. So in, in summary, we have seen the work of other vaccines in the past, smallpox vaccine, for example, measles, as I just shown in the slide before, where smallpox, for instance, has ended a pandemic which claims the lives of 3 million people. With COVID-19, we are upwards of 1.3 million people who have already died from, from it. And the world, including Trinidad and Tobago, continues to wait for a COVID-19 vaccine to be safe and effective to come on stream. And it can be the light at the end of our tunnel that all of us are looking for. Thank you, Al. Thank you, CMO. Next on the agenda is the question and answer segment. We <clears throat> once again remind our media representatives to state your name and the name of the media house that you represent before asking no more than two brief questions. Please ask both questions, one right after the other, to the relevant members of the panel. If time permits, we will facilitate a second round of questions, one question per media house. T today we begin the question and answer segment with questions from 98.1. And very good morning to you, Mr. Alexander, and uh, to Dr. Prasram and uh, Minister Dial Singh. Stephen Cummings here, 98.1 FM. Uh, my two questions are quickly, one for Dr. Parasaram and, of course, um, the other for Minister Dial Singh. And uh, start with uh, Dr. Parasaram. Dr. Parasaram, preparing for a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, um, you know, might be more than just having a few refrigerators and being in a COVAX program. There are issues of percentage distribution, supply chain, and just how technically trained are the recipients on the technical spectrum. The question is being asked again, are we really ready if and when such global uh, distribution begin? Um, would there be a need to look again maybe at our public health regulations regarding the administration of, uh, administration of doses? Um, you know, for, for example, we also have the issue of the pushback from uh, anti-vaxxers. To me, it appears to be a highly clinical and technical procedure. How advanced are we in this, um, in this measure of preparation? And uh, Minister Dial Singh, you began by talking about bubbles. Um, I've seen at least two official press releases from the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and the Arts with uh, strong invitations calling for persons to return to what it calls national performance spaces, basically saying that they are open for business. Now, despite the rule that persons should also adhere to the public health regulations and, and being humans as we are, are, are you not concerned that at this time we might be um, saying too much or, or, you know, that we might be a little too early in making such public call for a return to public spaces? And, of course, um, this has to do with the, the, the nature of, of the business. You know, we're talking about crowds. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So I will take both questions. You see, Amo has indicated that I should take both. <laughs> okay. So vaccine preparedness is really my portfolio, not the CMO's portfolio. As I indicated two weeks ago, we have already, okay, we did not start to prepare for these vaccines when the announcement was made first by Pfizer and then Moderna. We started to prepare months ago. We knew this was going to come, we just did not know when. So we started to prepare months ago, setting up a multidisciplinary team, which includes logistics, which includes um, storage, finance, IT, communications. That team is in place and has been working. I will get their weekly report on Monday. As far as storage is concerned, we could not advance issues of storage until we know what 
type of vaccine we are getting and the physical characteristics as per storage. But that does not mean we don't prepare. As I have said, we have already selected a site at Coover to build a chiller. We are going out for tenders hopefully next week to build that chiller. That chiller is being built or can be built regardless of which vaccine we get and its particular storage conditions. What will change and what we'll have to wait on is are we using a vaccine that is being stored at minus uh, 20 like Moderna or are we using a vaccine that could be stored at regular vaccine refrigeration temperatures of around 8 degrees like the AstraZeneca Oxford. So that part of it we don't know as yet. But we are continuing with plans to build the chiller and the step down at Coover. We have already engaged, as I, as I indicated at the press conference in Tobago last week, the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association via its president, Dr. Darren Dukiram, to have them be a part of the vaccine distribution program. But we cannot make final decisions until we know which vaccine we are getting from the COVAX facility. So plans are well advanced. The communication plan is being developed. You are seeing the first part of that communication plan this morning when the CMO gave you a brief history of vaccines. So we are priming the population to understand that COVID-19 vaccine is, a, is just one in a long history of successful vaccine interventions that saves millions of lives every single year around the world. Smallpox, CMO, has been eradicated yeah. around the world through vaccinations, right? So this is part of the communication plan and everything else is being done behind the scene. On the, it's on the issue of theater spaces and bubbles, any setting where the person or individual in a 50% crowd can keep on a mask, social distance, your chance of contracting the, vax, uh, the, <laughs> the virus here is very low. And that is why we are comfortable with allowing things like spotlight on education, spotlight on finance, spotlight on budget, and these the small theater things where people can maintain the social distancing and keeping on masks. What we are scared about are those situations in social gatherings where masks are taken off, where social distancing might start off at six feet, but after 10 minutes and you're talking to friends and family, you know, to hug up and kiss each other. A hey, long time I ain't see you. You know, the, you know the soccer song from two years ago. Long time I ain't see you. That is what we are scared about this Christmas season. So there's a distinction between performances and activities where people could adhere to the measures and one where people cannot adhere to the measures. So, Mr. Cummins, I hope that answers both of your questions, and thank you for asking them. Thank you, Minister. We now go to AZP News. We now go to AZP News. AZPnews.com. Minister, I see that you are only on a weekend on a Saturday. Um, it puts the media maybe um, in a little, in, um, at a little disadvantage. Sometimes we have questions of a policy and, and a political nature, you know, and, and rather, you know, we have you, um, maybe you are minister, like, for example, on Wednesday, I had asked about the tagging system that the prime minister had spoke about, because there are a lot of nationals uh, want to go maybe and do business and, and return, and they're concerned about whether they can do this in a safe manner with, with the proper um, uh, protocols, of course. So I just wanted to get your take on that and how far that has reached. And my second question, yesterday in Parliament, you spoke about the um, rapid testing that is going to be taken soon. Um, would that only be in, in public institutions and would, would, would eventually maybe um, private labs be, be given permission to do the, 
the rapid testing and not just PCR. Okay. Thank so, you. Um, Prior, could you just repeat briefly the first que question, please? Sometimes, um, us, you know, in the media, we have questions more of I got that. Just, the policy just repeat the, the question. Media. I know. Just oh, repeat the question. Um, about the, 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 the tagging system that the Prime Minister spoke about. Uh, I just wanted to find out what is the latest about that. You know, when it, or if it is going to be implemented. Oh, you mean the, um, the bra bracelets? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Well, I, yeah, sure. Okay, no problem. So as I indicated last week in Tobago, we are looking at it as soon as we have a firm policy position, we would come to you. But I did say in Tobago last week, the bracelet system, because of our constitution, and I've been advised by this body, EG, and I said this last week, Saturday, it will have to be voluntary because of our constitution and the right to privacy and a private life. And I said that clearly last week, Saturday, that position has not been changed. So any introduction of electronic tagging will have to be voluntary. So that's one. Two, the issue of the rapid test, the antigen test. Once any test is certified by WHO in the private sector or public sector, it can be used. The test we are using has been certified by the WHO. The same principles of approval will apply for instance, when private labs started to do PCR testing. So the same principles are going to apply for rapid antigen tests. Thank you very much, Prior. Thank you. We now go to the news day. Good morning, Janelle De Souza from Newsday. Um, I'm trying to make an idea of the health protocols for two groups of migrants. The first were these the 17 vulnerable Venezuelans who were released from state quarantine facility in Chagaramas. How are they being monitored? What um, what kind of position are they in now? As well as the group from Irene, um, are they doing well? Was testing done? Where are they being held? Right. So, so in both instances, the the individuals actually fall under the remit of national security. Um, the Ministry of Health will get involved with regards to the quarantine period. So through the offices of the CMOHs in various areas, they will be issuing quarantine orders and they assist um, national security in the event that persons become ill or persons require swabbing. But generally, in terms of the, the care of those individuals, they fall under national security. Thank you. Uh, we now go to CNC3. Babita Gopal, child. Okay, I think we may have to go back to her. So we'll go to 98.1, Mr. Cummings. Uh, yes, yes um, thank you again, uh, Mr. Alexander. And um, I have a question. Um, either the minister or uh, Dr. Parsham, you can take this one, either or. Um, there appears to be an ongoing issue on uh, disruption of health services at the Sandy Grandi Enhanced Health Center General Practitioners Clinic. Now, as, as late as yesterday, there was a temporary closure notice, and for over a period of months, you know, there have been numerous notices of temporary closures. Um, are you able to say why such frequent temporary closures, um, you know, to such an important facility at this time of a pandemic, either the minister or um, Dr. Prastram, CMO? Thank you. And I will have to get uh, an answer from the chief executive officer, and we will try to do that if my Corpcom persons mm -hmm. can contact the chief executive officer to give you an answer. Thank you very much. Okay, we now go back to Ms. Bavita Gopal Chansing. CNC3? Okay. All right, while we wait on um, further questions, I want to rem remind the public that we should also, also and always wear a mask over your nose and mouth when you go into public. Keep your distance from others, that's six feet. Stay home if you are ill. And of course, the minister would have emphasized the first to maintain that distance, especially during the Christmas season. 
wash your hands often with soup and water or use an alcohol-based sanitizer. I see we have uh, questions from Janelle de Souza. Yes, hi, Janelle. Just quickly, since the immigration system is under national security, just wondering, are those numbers that we have for the prison system, the 175, are they included, is the immigration, those from immigration facilities included in those numbers? I, I assume you mean the 175 positive persons from the prison. prisons, yeah? Yes. yes. Are they included, that 175, does that include the those from the immigration center? Okay, um, Janelle, you're mixing up two yeah. things. So um, please ask your question. Are you asking if the numbers from the prison system is included or from uh, the, the migrants? Uh, I think we are getting mixed up trying to figure out which one you are referring to. If, if the question is, are the figures from the prison system included in our numbers, the answer is yes. Correct, C CMO? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, the question is then, right. the 175 that of the prison system, are the numbers from the detention center included in that 175 or are there separate number? If it is separate, what are the numbers in the detention facility? Okay. Oh, right. So, so the initial numbers that we would have put out are from the maximum security prison. The numbers that we have gotten over the last few days, I don't know the total number. I know um, the CMOH had indicated to me there were five persons in the first instance from the IDC. So I have to get the complete um, data set from him. But initially it was completely from the maximum security part of the prison with a couple of cases from the Golden Grove side as well. Thank you, CMO. Mm -hmm. We now go to TTT. All right. Good morning, Minister Diaz Singh. This question is for you. Um, earlier this week, you would have mentioned that there would be some measures put in place to intervene on gatherings in private property. And I know you mentioned that you are also concerned about gatherings for Christmas. So is there a possibility that this would come into play before Christmas? So as I indicated on, um, on Tuesday, I indicated that on Tuesday at the Ministry of Health sought turning ceremony. I indicated I was going back to the office that day to have a talk with legal and the CMO. We have had those talks. The legal department of the Ministry of Health, under the suggestion of the Attorney General, has been conferring with the Office of the Attorney General to see if and how that could be done. But let me reiterate, we should not wait for the state to do anything punitive. What we are asking people to do is just be responsible this Christmas. You know, look at other countries where the state is telling people you could only have six people in your homes. We, we, are, we don't want to do that. All we are asking people, just be responsible for this one, look at how the Hindus were responsible. I had reached out to the Hindu community, both the Mahasabha and Swaha, very quietly to ask them from their places of you know, um, leadership to talk to their devotees and speak to their flocks as to how to celebrate Diwali this year safely. CMO, have we had any? cases traced to Diwali celebrations well, I at mean, all? Because it is, we in community spread, it's different, yeah. difficult to track to any event. But, but it, not there that hasn't, I am aware of. There hasn't been any serious uptick, uptick in cases that we could say was due to Diwali. Mm -hmm. So the Hindu community responded brilliantly to our calls. And that is how you could celebrate a holy and important festival safely. We are asking the same thing now of the Christian community, but also because Christmas is celebrated by all religions, by all peoples. Follow the example of the Hindu community. Celebrate safely and don't let COVID come into your house. If we do that, there will be no need, no need for the state 
to tell you what to do and not to do in your private setting. That is the best advice I can give um, this Christmas season and all years. Just resist the temptation to gather, to bring your... I don't know if the slide could go, go back up without, with all those circles. If it can, I will be appreciative if we could show it again now. Because this is exactly what you are speaking about. All those differences, that is it. COVID exists in all of these circles. Just don't allow it to come into your circle. I could tell you, Christmas for me this year will be celebrated only with my wife, my son, and daughter-in-law. That is it. That it is. That it is it. Sorry. It's going to be very quiet home by me. Normally, my home is like a train station for Christmas. I have told everybody this year, don't come home. Whether it's cousin, whether it's friend, whether it's aunt, my house is off limits. I have turned down every single invitation I have received for Christmas. I am 63 years old. I am diabetic. I don't want to spend Christmas in hospital. I don't want a nurse having to leave her home to come and see about Terence the Alsing on a hospital bed. I don't want to be intubated and be on an ICU machine. And if my parents were alive, I wouldn't go home by them because they would be older than me. So let's just all band together this Christmas, make some sacrifices this Christmas for a better 2021. Learn from the Hindu community. They, they celebrated Diwali from all accounts, safely and, responsibility, and responsibly. I will also tell you, I have already reached out to His Grace the Archbishop. I have already reached out to the IRO to spread the word from churches to mosques to temples to celebrate Christmas safely, but in a holy fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I see we do have a question from 98.1. Mr. Cummings? Yes, yes. Um, thank you again, uh, Mr. Alexander. I, I seem to be getting uh, some more <laughs> questions in. Um, Minister Dial Singh, just quickly, um, I know we are almost to the um, end of the uh, you know, press conference. Um, you've spoken time and time again about um, the challenges that you would come up against um, re the anti-vaxxers, apart from just the political distractions which may come from other quarters. Um, how ready are you to treat with um, that uh, section of the, of the medical fraternity? Um, because I think I remember you mentioned even doctors and persons who uh, are in certain strategic positions within um, you know, Trinidad and Tobago appear to be you know, very much not in tune with, um, with, with this whole business of, of, of uh, you know, a COVID um, vaccine at this time. Okay, so I have an answer from Sandri Grandi. What is happening at Sandri Grandi? They are closed this weekend as the facility is being stripped and polished, the floors, and that is why there is some disruption, but services have been relocated. So that should answer your question. As far as the anti-vaxxers, uh, uh, the anti vaccine movement is concerned, in 2019, WHO declared 10 health priorities, 10. In that 10, the anti-vaccine movement was one of the 10. It is something we have been dealing with in Trinidad and Tobago, like all other countries. Unfortunately, last year, it even reached into the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Very unfortunate by a medical professional. Um, so we are preparing to talk to the population about the safety of vaccines, the history of vaccines, and you saw the rollout of that program this morning when the chief medical officer gave you a history of the vaccination program that started with smallpox back in the 1700s. So this is part of the rollout of that public education program. It will be ramped up significantly after Christmas. I don't think the messages will be 
well received at Christmas time because you're competing for so many other messages at Christmas time. But once January, middle to late January comes, we will be starting to ramp up our messaging about how safe vaccines are. We'll be using opinion leaders. We have already reached out to some to talk to the population. We are constructing the message. We are deciding on a messenger and we are deciding on a medium, the three M's. Message, messenger, medium. We are going to be doing a very serious and robust public education program, especially on social media, because social media is where the anti-vaxxers thrive, not in mainstream media. So there is going to be some mainstream media um, presence, but most of the messages are going to be on social media. So look out for that. We have been planning for it, and we will roll it out in the middle to late January or depending on when we are going to get the vaccine and then work backwards with a timetable. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Mr. Cummins. Thank you, Minister. We have been having some technical dif difficulties with CNC3, so they would have WhatsApp their questions in. Okay. Uh, the first question, is the ministry ramping up visits or have a plan in order for businesses, retail outlets in particular, since Black Friday sales are continuing which we know is a major attraction for many citizens. And the second question, Dr. Hines mentioned on Wednesday that our goal with COVID-19 vaccination is not to develop herd immunity. How come? Al, you could repeat the second one for me. Well, sure. you repeat it after I answer the first one. Um, so in terms of the, the public health inspectorate has been and continues to visit establishments throughout the country. The Chief Public Health Inspector will normally provide me on every Friday a report with regards to compliance. Compliance generally is somewhere between, I would say, 85 to 90 percent in terms of adherence to the public health guidelines at the various um, outlets. I have asked for a little more detail in terms of the, the, the report that I'm getting to give me ideas of exactly what they have seen and in which particular areas, if there's any particular geographic area, if there's recurrent teams in particular institutions, they have been revisiting persons who have not been compliant as well. So we continue our efforts and going into Christmas, we will continue to do so um, using the Public Health Inspectorate as well as using officers that were hired for the specific purpose of visiting related to the new normal and examining that situation. Well, the second question. Yeah, the second question from CNC3 is, Dr. Hines mentioned on Wednesday mm -hmm. that our goal with COVID-19 vaccination is not to develop herd immunity. How come? Okay, I think you'll have to ask Dr. Hines <laughs> that question. But, but generally speaking, when you deal with a mass immunization program, um, the ultimate goal of most immunization programs is to no, develop that was not the question. some... Oh, I, remember? I remember the question. Um, the question has to do with how does herd immunity develop? And I think okay. the question asks, if I, if I remember correctly, should we allow people to contract the virus ah. to develop herd immunity? Okay, okay right. So the that's a different question. The answer is no. Yes, because so. in doing that, many people will die. Correct. So as you said in one of your slides, maybe yeah. you could put it yeah, back so, up. I mean, basically what herd immunity is developed in one of two ways. So either through vaccination, where you develop immunization, um, programs throughout the world to get your immunity level up in individuals and of course in populations or it can happen if you have persons that are infected. The addition of the persons that have already been infected and have um, naturally acquired immunity in addition to vaccination pools together to create a larger pool of, of people that are immune to any particular given disease. Two of them combined will give you a certain percentage in the population and as I said, for COVID-19, we're looking at upwards of 50%. We are, it's, it's really epidemiological modeling that we are doing to see worldwide what percent herd immunity. So basically the number of people in a given population that are required to be vaccinated or to have immunity in general to slow the spread of any particular disease. We recall that R0, which is the transmission potential from one individual to the next is just above two, was 2.3. Um, if we Im Im 
if we use that sort of modeling and we vaccinate half of the population, we will see a significant drop in R0, therefore a significant decrease in the transmission. But at which point it will actually be able to eradicate a disease? That's the number that we are unsure about in the world. Um, and it varies because of changes in the infectivity of the pathogen as time progresses. There are different strains, there's mutation, and there's a lot of variables that need to be catered into the equation before we can make that determination. But we will try to get to the largest number of the population as we can, based on the phases ascribed by WHO. Thank you very much, CMO. Um, we also have a question from AZP News. Yes, um, again, um, yeah, um, just to follow up, if um, someone has has had COVID, and would that person st um, um, still be recommended to get a vaccine when it comes wrong, you know, even though he may have antibodies in the system? And, and quickly, Minister, you, you didn't really answer my question where, um, on whether we'll see more of you at these press conferences. Thank you. Prior, you like me so much? <laughs> okay, so Prior, let me explain why it is difficult for both the CMO and I to be here three times a week. Uh, in managing the parallel healthcare system, which has done brilliantly, we also have the normal healthcare system to run. So we are running what COVID has done to the CMO and myself, uh, myself especially is in a space of nine months put a second healthcare system for me to run. Um, in the early days, I made myself available every day when we had press conferences every single day. Then we went three times a week, I made myself available. We took a decision that knowing that this is going to last about two years, if the CMO and I went at that pace, we will collapse. So we took a decision to let other healthcare um, persons take the lead. Not even Candice is here. To keep up at this pace is going to be difficult. We have been spending a lot of time over the past month or two months when I am not here um, three days a week, seeing about the rest of the healthcare system, making sure our maternal and infant mortality rates stay down, making sure our NCD program stays up. We are launching um, our new blood donation policy that takes a lot of behind the scenes work. Decentralization of mental health. We had a long meeting on that yesterday. This Wednesday, I did not attend the press conference, but I spent the time touring the St. James Cancer Therapy Center making sure the LINAC and the new CT SIM that we have launched there are providing radiation therapy free of charge to people. I have a long visit to make the San Fernando Hospital where we built a new labor ward. We fixed the mortuary. We want to put in the new cath lab. So it's a lot of other work managing the regular healthcare system. You drop that now on top of that COVID. So time, we have to manage time. We have to manage resources. And what we are doing by coming once a week, I will be here every Saturday unless something happens during the week. We still have two healthcare systems to manage. And we are managing resources, which is human resource, both at the ministerial level and the CMO, because he accompanies me. He was there with me on Wednesday. Remember, I still have two major infrastructural projects. I have to manage the head, of the head office. I have to manage central block, so I have to go there physically. I have to go physically to San Grande from time to time because we are building a new um, hospital there. So that is how my time <laughs> is being taken up. So I will be here generally every Saturday unless there is something urgent or important during the week. So um, as much as I would like to be here as often as possible, please understand that um, outside of COVID, we still have another healthcare system to run. And let me, let me explain to you, in other countries right now, women cannot get maternity services. You know that? Because their hospitals have been overrun by COVID. We have escaped 
all of that. But it does take time and effort behind the scenes to keep both systems of the parallel healthcare systems up so we can absorb the shocks, so we are resilient, and that is what resiliency means, to be able to absorb shocks and you don't collapse. And that is why I want to tie it back now to Christmas. If we conduct ourselves this year, both systems can continue running parallel, like a train line, one next to each other without intersecting. That's what a parallel healthcare system means. So I thank you for your wishes to see me mo more often, uh, but you will see me on a Saturday. <laughs> thank yes, you, Brian. I think he had, he had one other question. Yeah. yeah odd. So the other question is a very good question. So in terms of persons who have had COVID-19 before, because it is a very new virus to the world, we, we're looking at just under a year. We don't know how long persons who have had infection will have immunity for. Um, in certain same instances, they have done tests and they have seen six months, three months, um, that sort of time frame. But as the disease progresses in terms of age, and we do sampling of those individuals who have tested positive before, we would be in a better place to say how long immunity will actually last. Um, that being said, our first phase one, just to reiterate, the persons that will be vaccinated are persons over 60, those persons who have comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, and the like, our healthcare workers and other front frontline workers, for example, persons in the prisons, police service, um, fire service, port health, and lastly, those who are immunocompromised. So based on WHO's guidance for phase one, that will be our phase one target. We will continue to look at persons who have had infection, both from a research perspective in Trinidad and worldwide to see how immunity goes, does it wax and wane over time, and you know, basically make our decisions based on what the research shows. So Al, I think that's the answer to that question. So let me ask, so the Minister of Health will qualify for a COVID vac of course, vaccine? yes. Both, health, both healthcare worker and without without pulling strings, right? No. I am over <laughs> sixty. I am di diabetic. And you're a healthcare worker. Love, and I'm a healthcare worker. Yes. So I qualify on three three grounds. <laughs> so no back and all when they hear the minister of health get a COVID vaccine, eh? I'm not pulling strings. <laughs> Thank you very much, media representatives. I now hand you over to the honourable minister. Thank you very much, and I want to thank members of the media for asking very very good questions this morning. It raised a lot of issues, and we clarified a lot of issues. I want to end this morning by appealing once again to persons in all the risk groups to get the flu vaccination. Let me explain why. Last week, we only gave out 3,173. It has been declining. So to date, we have given out 43,641. What are the reasons for me asking people to become vaccinated against the influenza? One, it will save lives. Two, it will save hospital space. But three, I have put a timeline that the flu vaccination drive should end by around March of next year. Why is that? I want to avoid confusion in the minds of persons when we hopefully start the COVID vaccination drive. I, what I could predict if we are trying to give out two vaccines at the same time, people may think, you know, well, I received a vaccine last week, but that's the flu vaccine. Does that immunize me against COVID and vice versa? So to get around that confusion that may develop in the minds of people, let us finish off our flu vaccination drive by around March of 2021. We got an initial shipment of 100,000 by now, my hope should have been that we would have vaccinated 70,000. We are only at 43,000. Let's get that up. Um, I know during Christmas week it will drop off, but let's make an effort, go in, get vaccinated. It will drop off Christmas and New Year's. And then in January, let us, let us really go on a drive, get vaccinated. We are spending much money on press ads. They are there. Social media, it is there. Um, the RHAs will be going out this week to step it up. We are even using miking systems in, you know, how we announce things in villages and communities with mics. So we are, we are really appealing to people. 
Let this flu season vaccination drive finish by around March of 2021. Hopefully by that time, the COVID vaccine will be here. So we could have, we could have ended the flu vaccination drive, ended, done and dusted, and start up the COVID uh, vaccination program. So that's my final plea. So my two pleas before I close, no gatherings in your home this Christmas. Keep your bubble to yourself. <clears throat> Celebrate Christmas in a different way this year. Celebrate Holy, go to church. Celebrate the birth of Christ. But let's make sure we are around for 2021. Thank you very much, Al. Just to be clear, the flu vaccine does not protect you against COVID. Just to be clear, the flu vaccine does not protect you against COVID. And vice versa. vice versa. So let's finish with flu by around March, and then hopefully we could start something with COVID afterwards. Okay? Thanks, everyone, for your participation. As you enter the Christmas season, please protect yourself and your loved ones. Stay home if you are ill. COVID-19 is not a present you should give to anyone. Remember to adhere to the simple guidelines that we at the Ministry of Health continue to reinforce. Maintain at least six feet distance from others. Wash or sanitize your hands and clean frequently touched surfaces. And please, wear your mask when in public. Thank you.